Okay. Um, <laughs> the Billingsley example in the book, did anybody fight through their way through that and understand it? I think this is another one of those things like the Sterling formula where we actually just have to go our own way. Wait, where's the very last thing in chapter two is the Patrick Billingsley function, which is really due to um, a Dutch mathematician by the name of Van der Berg from the late 30s. And it's a very uh, classic construction. W A E R D E N. Yeah, I'm sorry that didn't come out. <laughs> Zoom out, there we go. There's a cartoon where it has math problems that expand. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. So, uh, in the book, in the book, what they do is uh, have this function, I think, from 0, 1, and, and then they keep bisecting right and then add all these things together. I'm not going to do that. Here's what I want to do. I want to start out on the interval 0, 1. Um, this is y equals x up to 1 half and, and y equals uh, 1 minus x there, thereafter, okay? So y equals x on this side, and y equals 1 minus x on that side, okay? So I'm going to call that function uh, f1. So how high is it? One half unit, right? Goes up a half unit. Now, I'm going to define f2 of x to be f1 of 4 to the first x. Okay? So, what does f2 look like? If you multiply by the argument of the function by 4, what does it do? It, it compresses it. So you have four repetitions of the function in the interval 0, 1 now, right? You, you vibrate four times when you go to 0, right? This, this thing, I have extended my periodicity. So f, f sub 1 is defined everywhere. And now like an accordion, when I multiply by 4, when x is 1, that's F1 of 4 is out there at 4, and I pull that all the way back, right? So F2 looks like like this. So I have four little saw teeth instead of one, okay? And then what do you suppose F3 is going to be? You know what I should do, just for the sake of sanity later on when we're dealing with indices? Maybe I should make the original one fact. And then F1 is F of 4x, F04 is F2, is F0, or squared x. That, then the 2 and the 2 match. Can we do that without getting overly excited? I'm just thinking ahead here. So then f sub n of x is the original f0 for the nx, right? So f sub 0 is the find of the real line. It's the, the gross sawtooth. And f sub n of x, uh-oh, I better, I better cut down the heights here. I better, let, me, let me do that. 
Let's divide this by 4, divide that by 4 squared, divide this guy by 4 pm. I think we got it now. Uh oh, let's see these grace. You see what? I'm just. If I just can read the bottom, I I'm, I'm, uh, I'm pairing these things down. So f sub 0 is 1 half unit high, and f sub 1 is an eighth of a unit high. And f sub 2 at its peak is a 32nd high, right? So they're dropping by a factor of 4. They're according, accordion together so that they, the next one is always 4 jumps where the last one had 1 jump, right? Every tooth of the last one becomes 4 teeth of the new one. And the teeth become 1 fourth as high. Okay? I mean, with don't, don't look at his picture. This isn't his picture. I know. I wasn't looking at his one. Uh, it's very in the chapter two. Billy. Oh, yeah. I, I had trouble figuring out his example, so I just sort of went my own direction here. I think I can explain this. Uh, okay. So that's how we get the Fn of x's. Are they all continuous? I would say so. Right? They're all continuous. Now let's focus on the compact Z01. seemed to be the first discoverer to copy about 1903. And uh, it's, it's called by some authors the Blancmange function because of the way it looks. So there was a puff paste for you to look at the graph. Of course, you can't ever look at the graph of the whole thing. You, look, you pick the first 10 have some have some atoms and add them together and make them when you get a and I should do that and you can kind of get a representation of how the thing might like. Yeah we did. We did. We didn't talk about the one that has four saw teeth for every previous one. We talked about the two. But there's something very clever about the four that didn't happen. That's what Billings the example was so Okay. Uh, this one is very, I think this is very intuitive. Let's we'll see what happens here. So that's the function. First order of business is to show that this is a continuous function. Well, what theorems do we have that bear on that? I'm summing up, uh, I'm summing up continuous functions. We, we had the theorem that a uniformly converging sequence of continuous functions converge to a uniform, converge to a continuous length, right? Point, the pointwise length of a sequence of uniformly converging continuous functions is continuous. You know? So aren't the partial sums, if, if the partial sums 
are finite sums of continuous functions. So they would all be continuous, right? And then this is the limit of a sequence of partial sums, all of which are continuous. So the sum of these things is a, uh, a limit, a pointwise limit in continuous functions. Now, is the convergence uniform? That's the big question. We know the pointwise limit uh, is, is uh, something. It's the phi of x. Do we know, do we know that it's uh, uniformly convergent? If it is, since these were all continuous, the partial sums are continuous, then phi of x would be continuous. So first we have to deal with that. That was one of the questions on the testing. Yeah, that, that theorem. The theorem that we're trying to use was there. 